Hello. talks about the testimony of a Samaritan woman. And at the time, Jews and Samaritans, they did not really interact. Because the Jews kind of looked down upon the Samaritans because they were, um, they were viewed as you know, dirty um, and not clean. And you know, it was almost um, unheard of to have Jews and Samaritans interact in public. Um, but that's not the case with um, Jesus. So now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he had come to a town of Samaria called uh, Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So Jesus was traveling through Galilee, and he stopped by this well. No, he was, sorry, traveling through Samaria, um, towards Galilee, and he stopped by this well to, to, to get some water. He was, he was thirsty, and he was, he was taking a break. A woman from Samaria came to to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. So at this time, he was just there at the well by himself, and this woman comes up to him. Or he comes up to draw water from the well, and they were there by themselves because Jesus' disciples had gone to go get some food in, in the market in the city. And Jesus calls out to her, he, he talks to her, give me a drink. And she's taken aback. She doesn't understand, why is this Jew talking to me? You know, you know this, is, this is breaking social code. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So this woman was confused. Jesus asked, you know, if, if you really saw, you know, um, if you knew the gift of God, and if you know who it was who was asking you, give me a drink, then um, you would be asking, you would be asking for the living water. But the Samaritan woman, she still didn't understand, so she's like, you know, this well is really deep, and, you know, how, how are you going to get any water out of it? So he said, uh, and she's like, and then who is this, who, who are you? Are you greater than, than Jacob, um, who, who made that well? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me that water, so I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So Jesus promised a living water. <laughs> and she, finally realizing what he's offering her, says, Yes, please, give it to me. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus 
said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem, you say that in Jerusalem, um, in Jerusalem is the place where pe people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is, is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now, and now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So this woman is just asking a simple question, um, and and he just he asks her this question by uh, saying, go, "Go call your husband," and she says, "I have no husband." Of course, she didn't say that she has had five husbands, but Jesus already knew that. So when he approached her about this, when he brought it up, she knew that you know that he must be a prophet, that he must have divine knowledge, because there's no way that, that he could have known this about her. And so she asks, um, where are we to worship in Jerusalem or here? And Jesus answers, you know, the time is coming when salva and salvation is near. And you will not have to worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem, but you will worship everywhere. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will teach us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So Jesus... Jesus just opens up to her and tells her that he is the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? So the disciples came back and they knew that what was going on was not normal. But they didn't dare to ask. Because this was their, their, their rabbi, their, their teacher. They didn't question his authority. So the woman left her water jar and went away to town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out, they went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, There are four months then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. For that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that you should that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So while this time Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's speaking in parables. And the disciples are, are curious and they're saying, eat this food. But Jesus replies, I already have food that, that, you, that you don't know about. So many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. The woman went around the town saying, he told me all that I ever did. And it's by her testimony that they believed. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many will believe because of his word. Then they said to the woman, It is no longer because of you, of, of what you said that we believe, for we have heard it ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So at this time, the, the Samaritan village heard the good news of Jesus Christ through, this, the, through the testimony of this woman. And it was this that introduced them to the gospel. So uh, testimonies have real power to really introduce the power of Jesus Christ, the, the good news, to, to the people who you speak your testimony to. And then, when they seek Jesus Christ themselves, then they, then they find the truth. And so, because there's so much power in testimony, I kind of wanted to share um, part of my own. Um, and so, growing up, um, my uh, parents got divorced when I was four years old. And after that, I moved in with um, my, my grandparents and my mom. And um, it was overall a hard time. And just being four years old when, when, your parent, when all this is happening in your, in your family and your family is, is splitting up 
and all this. It was very confusing, and it was a very turbulent time. And um, all, all growing up, it was uh, it was very trying. And I couldn't control the circumstances in my life, but I knew that one thing that I could control was um, my schoolwork and my grades. And so during this time, I kind of receded in, into that, and I occupied myself with my studies and the grades that I got in school. And so in middle school and high school, um, I, would prior, I would prioritize my grades and my schoolwork over almost everything else. And even when I came to, the, to know our Lord Jesus Christ and, you know, the, the wonderful good news and, um, of the cross, I still would oftentimes prioritize my schoolwork over the creator of this world. And so sometimes I would skip church to stay home and study for a test. I would only read my Bible when, when I'm free, when I didn't have any more work to do, when I finished my homework. I would only go to fellowship events when it was convenient for me. And I really prioritized myself and my grades over everything else. And it got to the point when grades and schoolwork became almost an idol in my life. And it wasn't until um, I, I, I had set these goals that I would get a certain GPA, I would get certain grades, I would do well, um, I would apply to uh, college and you know, I had this vision that when I was, when I accomplished all my goals, I'd be satisfied, I would be so happy and filled with joy. And when that day finally came, when I did accomplish everything that I had set out to accomplish, and I thought that it would be the happiest day of my life, and that every single day from then on, waking up, I would be so happy knowing that I had accomplished everything that I had ever wanted. I woke up feeling empty and dry and knowing that this was not what I had expected at all. I was living for the next grade, the next report card, for the day when colleges would let me know whether or not I was accepted. And it wasn't until this time that I really realized that I was filling my life with something that was not eternal, something that was not permanent, and it was just leaving me very empty. And it's a lot of people say that there is a God-shaped hole in your heart. And oftentimes, people of this world, they try to fill that hole with other things. For me, it was grades, it was success, it was accomplishments. For other people, it might be their friendships. It might be money. It might be work. For others, you might try to find, you might peg your identity, you might peg your self-worth onto other things, how popular you are how many friends you have on Facebook, how many followers you have on, on Instagram. And when you, when you try to equate your, your self-worth with something of this world, it's always going to leave you disappointed. And um, so if we turn to Matthew chapter 19, Possessions. 
he walked away sorrowful because he knew how much he treasured everything that he owned. He put his identity in what he owned, how much money he had, all of his possessions. And that's why he left disappointed and sorrowful. And Jesus isn't always calling us to sell everything that we have because he blesses us with, with all that we do have. But he blesses us with things, but these things should not become idols in our lives. Our identities should remain in Christ and in Christ alone. And um, so when you do place all of your self-worth, all of your heart into something that is temporal, something that will pass away, you know, you're, you're always going to be seeking for something more. And you're going to be trying to fill this hole in your heart that can only be filled by love with other things. And it's always going to leave you empty. And so if we turn to um, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so, in God, we are new creations. All, all the things that we have held in high esteem in our past, we could, all, we could just let that go. Let that part of our past shed. And I know that for me, that was a real struggle. And grades had such a big part of my life. Um, and, you know, truth be told, it was, it was an idol, and it was, it was, um, it was hampering my relationship with, with God. And so, if you realize that, you know, your identity is pegged to something that is other than Christ, other than knowing for 100% that you are a loved child of God, you can shed that away through Christ. We are new creations. And so, you know, all of our old stresses, all of our old anxieties, all of our old ways, all of our old identities, we can just shed that and we can come into the new identity that is in Jesus Christ. And in Galatians 2.20, which Julie read this morning, been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So are we living for ourselves, or are we living for Christ? Are we willing to die to ourselves? Are we willing to lay down our old identities at the cross, whether it be grades, whether it be money, whether it be job, whether it be Facebook or Instagram, popularity, friends, whatever it may be. Are we willing to lay that at the cross? And, and take up this new identity. Are we willing to die to ourselves and live in Christ? And so, I just want to ask you guys, where is your identity? In your times of trial, when you're, when you're down, when you're depressed, when your whole world is com coming crashing down, when you've accomplished everything that you've accomplished, when you've gotten perfect report card and got into every single school that you wanted to, are you still going to have that identity? So, in Matthew, chapter 8, verse 24, it talks about building your house on the rock. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them well, do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and the great was the fall of it. So when the rains do come, is your house going to stand because it's rooted in Christ, the rock, the cornerstone, or is it going to fall because you place your identity, yourself, your soul, in other things? Because you pegged your identity, your self-worth, into graves, into money, into popularity, into friends. When you don't have that anymore, when the rains come, where will your identity be? And I just want to remind you that no matter what this world has to offer, Jesus is so much more. No matter what. And Jesus, he will provide. Seek him first and he will make your path straight. He will provide all your needs. Place your identity in him. Not in other things. Not in things that will perish. Build up your treasure in heaven. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So I just want to ask you again, where is your identity? Is it in Christ? Or is it in something else? I just urge you to pray about that um, just tonight or in this upcoming week. And just talk to God and ask Him to take His place in your heart. To fill that God-shaped hole in your heart that only He could fill. If you've been trying to fill that with other things, just speak to God. Just come on your knees. Just let Him know. Let Him know that you want your identity to be in Him. That you want to build your house on the rock. That you want to be like the wise man who builds up his treasure in heaven. Where it will stay for eternity. <coughs> and so, with that, I just want you to keep in mind in the next week. Just, just ask yourself, where is your identity? Thank you guys. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jesus.